Hey, Walter. Hey, good evening, teacher. How are you? A uh, kind of angry. I oh. have some problems in order to try to to pay my membership of a credit card. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have some troubles uh, a couple of hours ago. <laughs> mm. Yeah. I always revert that that church, but this month is an exception. The bank is 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 charge that that fee that church in my statement is so difficult to try to to revert you have to yes it's a lot of work and you have to explain and you have to ask and i don't know why and always well not always but usually they revert the charge yeah. so for me yeah. is is more difficult the process than automatically only automatically revert and that's it yeah 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 but today was difficult to me, but um, I had to call and explain that because the process always deal over the 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 the, the WhatsApp and WhatsApp and I automatically uh, revert the church. But today I had to call and explain. Oh my God, it's so difficult. It's angry. Yes, I can imagine. And happen and happen always with Banco Agricola because a uh, 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 a membership is every three months. Yeah, yeah, this is a problem. Exactly, exactly. With and it's only with those banks that you know it, and it's and they always have oh, but you have to spend so much, and if you spend, then we do. Yeah. It's not a problem. And I think yes, but it's why is why not just have it for free i i you pay interest you pay for the car you you pay for other yeah. things so for me it's yes it's better mm -hmm. it's angry that situation and that, that mm -hmm. a bank happening in bank agricola i don't know i was working at that bank uh even though uh sells credit card oh wow credit card but I uh, discovered some ways in order to don't pay membership. I have uh, I have my credit card for 10 years and never pay any membership. <laughs> That's but today, oh, probably, probably I, I will pay, but I hope not. <laughs> okay. Yes, I can imagine. I can imagine how upset you yeah. were. Yeah. <laughs> I want to hit them hard. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that you connected and I'm glad that we have a couple other people here as well. I see we have William and Sandra and Nicole. Today, we're going to go ahead and continue um, our different types of questions. Remember, yesterday we saw two types and we saw function and attitude. Today, we're going to be looking at organization and connecting content. To help us a little bit, we're going to review how uh, the two topics of organization and then of connecting content. Okay. okay. And then we're going to practice some exercises. So the first part is organization questions. Let's take a look so that we can remember what they are and how we use them. Okay. There. Okay. I think now you can hear better, yes? Okay. Hi, welcome back. This time we'll go over organization questions. Organization questions ask you to show understanding of how a lecture is structured. You can recognize organization questions because they often include phrases such as, why does the professor mention? Or, why does the professor discuss? These kinds of phrases show that organization questions are often asked about the examples in a lecture. So it helps to listen for examples. 
and think about why the professor is using them. Now let's look at a sample question. Okay, so if you recall, this type of organization question is the purpose. Why do they mention that? Like, what is the purpose of talking about that? Uh, why did he give this uh, bank as an example, or this person, or this country, or this, or this book? That is the purpose of this. Organization questions are, what is the function of that? What is the relationship from that example and what they are saying? This is the important. Now, I remember Walter asked um, yesterday, is not normal to write. You will always have multiple choice. In this part, wow. uh, you will not be writing. It will be multiple choice as the others. So you don't have to worry about, Ooh, what if I have the right spelling, the right word? No, always is going to be multiple choice. Here we go. Here's a listening tip that can help you understand how a lecture is organized. Listen for signal words that indicate that introduction, mere ideas, examples, and the conclusion or summary. These might be sequence words like first, next, and then, or they might indicate time or chronology like before, during, or since, or they could show cause and effect like accordingly or as a result. These signal words are good cues for when to take notes. Skill building tips. Listen for signal words. Introduction, major ideas, examples, conclusion. First, next, then, second, finally. After, at last, before, during, now, since, obviously, of course, accordingly, as a result, because, for example, for instance, in conclusion, to summarize. Now, as I mentioned, I just want to help you remember that in organization questions, in these type of questions, the best way is listen for an example. And then why you when you hear an example, why? Why this example? Start thinking. It's almost impossible to remember all of the words. For example, the word first and then and during and all of these, it's great. It's great because it'll help you. It'll help activate your listening. But the main idea is why those examples? That is the clue and that is the thing that's gonna help you the most, okay? Any questions about organization questions? It's clear? It's clear, sir. All right. Yes, it's clear. Excellent. So, and then we have the second type of questions for this evening, which are connecting content questions. Okay. Here we're going to rewatch the video just to make sure that we remember and then we're going to practice. Finally, on this course, we'll take a look at listening connecting content questions. Listening connecting content questions ask you to show understanding of the relationship among ideas in a lecture. Connecting content questions may require you to fill in a chart or table, or they may ask things like, what is the likely outcome? These type of questions will ask you to put together information from different sentences or different parts of the conversation or lecture. You may be asked to identify things like steps in a process or cause effect relationships, or you may be asked to classify items in categories or make a prediction connecting content questions, steps in a process, cause and effect, classification, make a prediction. Now let's look at a sample connecting content question. Okay. Now, not always you're gonna have to answer two questions, but you have to be prepared to make sure that you understand clearly what are the things that they are saying. Remember, here it's not just, oh, the main idea, not just the, you need to be sure that you are clear on who says what. So how are they going to trick you? Well, uh, uh, it's so hot. How do you feel? And then, oh, I think it's okay. Did the, did the man say he felt hot or the man said he was okay? They're going to trick you by giving you the answer that was spoken, but not necessarily the person said it. And that's where you have to be careful. 
right? So you might have two speakers, usually a man and a woman, because they want you to have the difference. And then they're going to say, why did the man say this? Why did the woman say this? Or what did the man say? And then you have to be clear who is speaking. Or they're going to say another example. Oh, my mom was angry because she I didn't wash the dishes. What did the man say? Oh, A, he didn't wash the dishes. B, his mom was angry at him. Or And then this is where you have to be careful in the listenings. It's okay, the connecting content questions. Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. Good, good. Remember, the tip is you are going to hear information from the conversation, but not all the information is from the speaker they're asking you about. That's the difference. Not necessarily is that speaker. Here's a tip to help you connect ideas when you listen. When you listen to recorded material for the first time, stop the recording at various points and try to summarize what has been said. Then predict what will be said next. So it's all about getting it and making the prediction. Today, we're gonna to be practicing those two types of questions first. We're gonna practice organization and connecting questions. So connecting content questions. So the first part is organization questions. So here, as you can see, they're going to be automatically, when I read the question, fires. Oh, okay. So I'm going to listen for the example of fires. Why? Why is the fires? How is it important for the conversation? That's number one. Then when I listen to the next one, oh, aspirin. Why did the person mention aspirin? This is the idea for these types of questions. Remember, in these types of question is why those examples? Why those examples, right? Why not a different examples? So yes, it's good to understand it, but the most important is understand why the example and not a different example. Okay. Do we have any questions? No, we are ready to practice? Yes. Okay. Remember, this is section two from the platform, organization questions. Let's see. We're going to make up the groups. I see we have one, two. We have two oyentes. All right. So we make sure that we divide them up into the different groups. One. So, okay, I think we're okay with that. Let me move just a little bit more. Hang on, let me try one more. Okay, guys, I think this is ready. Okay, so let's practice with our partners. Um, here we have, you can share the screen if you want. For those of you that are watching the video, here we have the opportunity to listen and answer the questions. It used to be that the safety of a house was judged simply by whether it stood up or not. Well, things have changed. Uh, during the 20th century, people began to build houses with synthetic materials. And unfortunately, these materials have proved over time that they endanger the health of the owners or uh, the house's occupants since the owner doesn't necessarily live in the place. So uh, what are these synthetic materials? Well, asbestos, for example. Asbestos, which was used as roofing sheets and paneling. This was found to cause memory loss. No, I'm sorry. It causes lung cancer. Asbestos has been found to cause lung cancer and formaldehyde causes memory loss. 
Formaldehyde was used in um, insulating foams, synthetic resins, and uh, glues in things like plywood, chipboard, hardboard. Formaldehyde used in this way causes damage to the nervous system and, as I said before, memory loss, severe memory loss. Um, then there are wood preservatives. Now, they contain, wood preservatives contain, potent fungicides and insecticides. These cause cirrhosis of the liver, bone marrow atrophy, and nervous disorders. I'm really painting a bleak picture, aren't I? And, uh, and that brings us to paints. At one time, lead was the major ingredient in paint. You may think that when lead levels were restricted due to lead poisoning, that was the end of the problem. Now, get this. Paint technologists came up with even more poisonous metals, such as cadmium, to add to paints. <laughs> okay. Ah, uh, the dangers of synthetic material are most apparent when a fire breaks out. Experts say that today, more people are killed by toxic fumes in house fires than by the fire itself. We may have used a lot of synthetic materials in house building, but in fact, for every synthetic material used in a home, there's a biological or natural counterpart. Okay, well, we can't all go, <laughs> we can't very well go and tear down our houses and start from scratch. However, there are ways to recognize and safely remove some synthetic material and replace it with natural alternatives. 1. So why does the speaker mention fires? Is it to illustrate how unsafe wooden houses are? To show other ways in which synthetic materials are dangerous? To let people know about the toxic fumes when using natural alternatives? Or to demonstrate what happens when cadmium is added to paint? Number two. Why does the speaker mention aspirin bottles? It's been said that necessity is the mother of invention. And this may be true in some cases, but most things that people need already exist. We inventors tend to be a group of dissatisfied people. We see the drawbacks of products that are already in existence. I think most people do. Think of something that annoys you, your partner leaving the cap off the toothpaste, for instance. Now, the difference between most people and an inventor is that while most people grumble, an inventor starts to visualize solutions. We really get swept away with this enthusiasm, this passion for remedying the problem. We aren't grumpy, unhappy people. But let me say this. We may be dissatisfied, but we also tend to be very optimistic problem solvers. One has to be optimistic, extremely optimistic, to persist through the inevitable failures. Why? Because we fail a lot. But inventors thrive on failures. Where most people get discouraged and give up, inventors use failures as stepping stones to new approaches and then to eventual success. I shouldn't say success, because once the invention is completed, we often see another fault. Sometimes, in fact, an invention brings about a change that requires another invention. A case in point is the aspirin bottle. Small children manage to get into aspirin bottles with, um, unfortunately, sometimes fatal results. So the childproof bottle cap was invented. However, arthritis sufferers couldn't open the childproof bottle to get their medicine. In response to this problem, the two-way cap was invented. So now, users can choose the most convenient way to close the bottle. Problem solved? No. 
because a small child and an arthritis sufferer could share the same household. What are we going to do about it? Let's toss some ideas around to get your inventor brains operating. Okay, so why does the speaker mention the aspirin bottles? To demonstrate the continuing process of invention, to illustrate failures, to show how inventions can cause fatalities, to show that you can't satisfy everybody all the time. Now, number three. Why does the professor mention orange peels? One way cultural anthropologists can study a culture is by sifting through garbage dumps. Garbage is the remains of what a society used or threw away. Let's take, for example, an orange peel. What can I tell by looking at an orange peel? Well, um, I think you could possibly tell whether that orange was eaten or made into juice. Okay, good. Hmm. Let's imagine that we have a pile of orange peels, okay? This pile of orange peels indicates they were squeezed to make juice. What information can I gain from that? You could find out, uh... Count those peels and estimate the number of oranges used. Uh, enough for two glasses may indicate a single person or, or a couple. And enough for a couple of quarts might indicate a family. Good. So we can make estimates on numbers of people. We can make even more assumptions. For example, what could we infer if there's enough for 50 people? Um, what would a seasonal change in the number of peels indicate? As you can see, an analysis of what's discarded can help us map out patterns and give us insights into human behavior. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on one's point of view, much of what's thrown away is organic. So when we're sifting through, say, the garbage dump of a Paleolithic village, the remains are limited. Of course, there are places where artifacts are better preserved, areas with dry desert air, such as Egypt, for instance or with freezing temperatures, such as the Arctic regions. Oh, we've run out of time. Okay, I want you to think about, when you pass a pile of garbage, look at it and think about what that garbage can tell you. Tomorrow we'll discuss cultural anthropologists and the issue of grave robbing. Okay, so why does the professor mention the orange peels? To demonstrate what can be learned from them, to show how to find out how much orange juice a family drinks, to encourage people to make their own juice, to demonstrate how studying something organic is preferable. Number two, why does the professor regret that most garbage is organic? Because our world is being filled with garbage? Because it is disgusting to sift through? Because it is disintegrates, leaves no clues about its cultural origins? Or because its preservation is limited Hang on, my apologies, because its preservation is limited to the Arctic region, okay? And the last one, number five. So today we're going to continue our discussion of various mental disorders. Specifically, I'm going to focus on various anxiety disorders. Now, of course, everyone feels anxious or uneasy now and again. You may feel anxious on your first day of a new job or when you have to meet someone important, for example. Some people feel anxious when they visit the dentist. Some typical symptoms include a pounding heart, sweaty palms, or a dry mouth. But now, suppose that the anxiety is serious enough to keep you from enjoying life. Maybe it interferes with your work or controls much of your daily routine. Or maybe you experience occasional instances of anxiety that are terrifying enough that you become immobilized with fear. 
Maybe you will take extreme measures to get away from the object or situation causing the fear. Now, these anxieties can be put into three main groups according to what causes the reaction. The first are what we call specific phobias. These are the most common phobias, and their focus is specific objects. In fact, the thing feared is often relatively safe, and also the sufferer usually realizes that and knows that their fear is irrational. A very common specific phobia is fear of heights, for example. This fear is very common. No doubt some of you have felt this fear from time to time. Fear of spiders and insects is another common one. Spiders are not usually harmful. Well, not usually anyway. But some people break out into a cold sweat and have heart palpitations and become immobile even if they know a spider is on the other side of the room. Some of the less common phobias seem rather bizarre. For example, would you believe some people are afraid of color, say the color yellow? Another strange one is fear of laughter. I guess that's not a laughing matter for the sufferer. Okay, so what causes these specific phobias? Well, we don't know exactly. We do know that they tend to run in families, and they are apparently slightly more common in women. Many of them persist, that is, they don't go away on their own. At least that tends to be the case with phobias that develop in adolescence or adulthood. Specific phobias that develop in childhood are more likely to disappear with time. Another category of phobia is called social phobia. This fear is really the fear of being embarrassed or humiliated in front of other people. If social phobia is serious enough, it can prevent a person from continuing in school or work, and maybe that person avoids making friends. Now, some social phobics can actually be at ease with other people most of the time, except in particular situations. So, for example, a sufferer here may believe that small mistakes they make are more significant than they really are, or feel that everyone is looking at them. They could also be extremely fearful of, for example, using the phone in front of other people. Or it may be something really simple and seemingly irrational, such as drinking a cup of coffee, or even, say, buttoning a coat in front of others. A third category of phobia is known as agoraphobia. Do I need to put that on the board? No? Okay, fine. Okay, so this phobia causes people to suffer anxiety about being in places or situations from which they perceive it might be difficult to escape or in which it seems help is not available. So agoraphobia might include a fear of traveling alone, being alone in a crowd, or uh, being unable to leave a place easily. People with this condition often develop the disorder after suffering from a panic attack. That is, a feeling of intense terror with symptoms such as sweating and shortness of breath. Such panic attacks may occur randomly and without warning, so this makes it difficult for a sufferer to predict what kind of situation will provoke a panic attack. So then, he or she will try to avoid situations and places where such attacks have happened previously. Okay, to wrap up today, well, the good news is that all of these disorders can be treated with some degree of success through various medications and therapies. Tomorrow, we'll look in more detail at the kind of treatments that might prove useful in dealing with some of them. Okay, great. Let's take a look at it and make sure that everybody's got them correctly. Jenny, how are you? Are you feeling great? Jenny? Hi. Hey, are you ready? Yes. Okay. Did you finish with your partners? I oh, I have some technical problems. <laughs> Oh, okay, okay. So you couldn't finish, Walter? No, yet. Not yet. Okay, no problem. What about the other groups? Everybody finished? 
No, teacher. Only no. four. Only four. Okay, don't worry. We're going to get to them. The... Also, problem in order to play the, the audios. Oh, okay. You had to open it in another window. Uh, so just the, the download, the, 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 the file. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, sometimes what works for me, Walter, is... I don't know if it's a, it's a problem of platform. I don't know because I, I don't know if the other people are obligated to to download. But for me, yeah. I usually open the pop-up. I Right here, do you see the pop-up? Uh huh. I click on the pop up and yeah. then here I don't have to download, but I can play directly. And oh, then... no, I couldn't. I couldn't. Okay. So this might be because your computer settings have a pop up blocker. So sometimes when you, when you your you automatically have the system for pop up blocker, and then you can't uh, you can't have it. You have to download it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it's normal in computers. Um, many times for your security. You, sometimes you forget i know and you don't want the announcement you don't want the announcement but it it functions with the same purpose so that's oh, why you might in an exam <laughs> yes this is a problem for the exam that's why you have to be you have to be clear that everything is operational yeah. and running yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay well jenny was going to do number one i think if i was correct yes. jenny yes yeah. all right mm -hmm. uh -huh. go ahead jenny the the number, the number B, the, the B. B to show okay. other ways in which synthetic matter are dangerous. Okay, thank you, Jen. Thank you. Number two, who's going to do number two? Me. Okay, thank you, Sandra. Okay, why does the speaker mention aspirin bottles in, in letter A to demonstrate? Uh, the continuing process of invention. Okay, good. Number three, who's got number three? There are eight to demonstrate what can be learned from them. Okay, thank you, Nicole. Number four. Letter C. Okay, good, because it disintegration leaves no clues about its cultural origins. And I know that some groups couldn't finish the last one. What was number there five? Letter B. Letter B. B, to indicate B. that it... No, B. Letter B. B. B, okay, to indicate that it is rational to have an anxiety attack in some situations. No, letter B. D, sorry. Yeah, Give an example, an example of anxiety triggers for no, some people. No, letter B. Okay, I see some people. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, listen, I, I listen to both. Okay, okay, no problem. We're going to check in this moment. And we can see that letter D is the correct one. Is for an example you know, of what it is to give, uh, what is a trigger for some people. Number four was letter C because it disintegrates not, and then no, there is no clue. Um, for the orange peel, for number three is, we can um, demonstrate what can be learned from them. Number two, the aspirin bottle is about continuing process of invention, letter A, and number one was B, to show others in which way synthetic materials are dangerous. Now, I understand that some of you didn't finish or had some technical issues, that's okay. But remember, it's okay in the class. In the exam, there's no excuse. In exam, you lost the opportunity to answer other questions and you have it. So that's where you have to be careful. And that's why I always recommend, make sure you are clear what is best for you, online, the exam, or in person. I've mentioned a couple of times that there are pros and cons to each one. Online, you have your own house, your own comfort, you organize your time, you can, you don't have to travel, you have a lot of things. And online, you can have a piece of paper and nip and pen and take notes. In person is more difficult. You cannot have the paper, but they give you the, the sheets. So only about having that, what is best for you and what you need. 
Now we're going to go to the second part. The second part of today's listening practice is connecting ideas. Remember, we're connecting content questions. Now here is a little bit more difficult. Why? We're going to be focusing on selecting two. One more time, selecting two answers for the questions. So we look, we have many options. Here is the question. What can be said about fish rubbings? And you need to select two. What is correct? Okay. The same for number two. And the same for number three and number four. And that's the ones. So here is one listening. Is correct. It's one listening. But you have four questions. Remember, for each question, you have to find two listenings or two answers for each question. It's okay? Okay. Okay. Yes? Okay. So for this one, I'm going to give you 12 minutes. Why 12 minutes? Because the listening, only one listening, listening one time is six minutes. It's six minutes just for one listening. It's long, long. And here is where it's necessary for you to develop your skills of what information is important. What are you going to do? Are you going to remember for six minutes the conversation and then answer? Are you going to read the question and listen each conversation and answer? Are you going to take notes and listen and then answer? Here's where you have to decide what technique is best for you and the type of form that is easy for you to remember. Are you good listening and remembering? Are you good listening and taking notes? Are you good reading and in the moment making the decision? You have the different options to select, okay? So this one, you have enough time to listen two times, but that's it. Listen two times and you have to make your decisions quickly. No, oh, uh, 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 no. You listen and then make the decisions. Okay. Are we ready? Any questions? Yes. No questions. No questions. Okay. Let's go. Daniel, you okay? Okay, for those that are listening, now we're going to try. For those that are at home, remember, Listen and answer the questions. One. You didn't come to art class yesterday, did you? Uh-uh. I got out of my chemistry lab late. Anything important I missed? Yeah. Dr. Matthews has arranged for us to meet at the art museum next week. Um next Tuesday. I think that's the 26th, because the museum's got a special exhibition on fish rubbings. Fish rubbings? Uh, what's that? Not a hands-on exhibition, I hope. No. Well, uh, not exactly. You missed a good lecture, though. Fish rubbings. It's an ancient art form in which fish are used to make prints. Sounds slimy. Where was this practiced? Um in the Far East, and by some native peoples in America. Will Dr. Matthews expect us to make some of our own fish rubbings afterwards? I suppose that's up to you. I think it might be interesting to give it a try. What can be said about fish rubbings?
Select two. Two. Okay. The world's heaviest gold coin is worth millions of dollars. It was minted in the year 1613 in India. The name of its issuer, Mughal Emperor Jehangir, his name is stamped on the coin. Prior to the reign of this emperor, prior to his reign, rulers in India had to obtain permission to mint coins from the caliph, the ruler in Baghdad. Okay? However, Emperor Jehangir changed this tradition. Okay? He um, started his own policy of issuing coins, coins in his own name. It was during the time of the Mughal dynasty that many art forms were encouraged to flourish. Emperor Jehangir supported the arts. Therefore, it's not surprising that the art of minting coins began and um, reached its peak of perfection during his reign. What is true about Mughal Emperor Jahangir? Okay, number three. three. When microscopes are referred to, most people think of optical microscopes. These instruments were developed principally to meet the needs of the biological sciences. They aren't that useful for metallurgists. They, uh, metallurgists have large and awkwardly shaped specimens. So those who need to examine metal objects or metal structures use a metallurgical microscope. This is a special, uh, the observing and illuminating systems of a metallurgical microscope are mounted in a way that allows adjustment for accommodating odd-shaped samples. Metallurgical microscopes are equipped with devices that provide the capacity to measure an object in the X, Y, and Z axes. These microscopes are frequently used in the field instead of in the laboratory, so they must be, must be more durable. How is a metallurgical microscope different from an optical microscope? Okay, number four. Four. Since people communicate mostly through speech, you can imagine that a defect in speaking or hearing abilities can be an enormous handicap, right? Okay. There are three conditions in which communication disorders can result. Any ideas what these may be? Three conditions. Yes? Well, the obvious condition, I think, would be a physical one. Let's say, like, if someone's eardrum has been damaged because of an illness or an injury, that person might not be able to hear. And um, being deaf or partially deaf not only affects the person's ability to hear, but also, deaf people's speech sometimes isn't all that clear, so that makes it difficult for others to understand them. You bet. If something goes wrong with the speech or hearing mechanisms, communication disorders can result. Uh, Sue? Well, I have a cousin who suffered brain damage in an accident, and he can't speak very well. And some people are just born with uh, something wrong. Yes, that's a condition we would classify we classify it under the condition of abnormal functioning of the brain. Besides accidents, people may be born with this condition or it can occur as a result of a stroke or a tumor. And the third condition, anybody? Well, some people have been uh, badly shocked, uh, traumatized, and they get kind of emotionally upset, you know. I read about a boy who just stopped talking after he saw this really terrible accident. Good point. Yes, an unusual emotional or psychological problem can cause communication disorders. Okay, so communication disorders can result from, um, one, something going wrong with the speech or hearing mechanisms, uh, two, abnormal functioning of the brain, and finally, an unusual emotional or psychological problem. Now, fortunately, most communication disorders can be improved to, to some degree with the help of a speech pathologist. What is true about communication disorders? Okay. 
Great. So now you had the opportunity to listen to everything once and make your decision. This is not normal on the exam, but because we are in class, we're going to listen again and choose the best answer or check your answers to make sure that it's clear for you. One. You didn't come to art class yesterday, did you? Uh-uh. I got out of my chemistry lab late. Anything important I missed? Yeah. Dr. Matthews has arranged for us to meet at the art museum next week. Um, next Tuesday. I think that's the 26th. Because the museum's got a special exhibition on fish rubbings. Fish rubbings? Uh, what's that? Not a hands-on exhibition, I hope. No. Well, uh, not exactly. You missed a good lecture, though. Fish rubbings. It's an ancient art form in which fish are used to make prints. Sounds slimy. Where was this practiced? Um, in the Far East and by some native peoples in America. Will Dr. Matthews expect us to make some of our own fish rubbings afterwards? I suppose that's up to you. I think it might be interesting to give it a try. What can be said about fish rubbings? Okay, number two. Two. The world's heaviest gold coin is worth millions of dollars. It was minted in the year 1613 in India. The name of its issuer, Mughal Emperor Jehangir, his name is stamped on the coin. Prior to the reign of this emperor, prior to his reign, rulers in India had to obtain permission to mint coins from the caliph, the ruler in Baghdad. Okay? However, Emperor Jehangir changed this tradition. Okay? He, um started his own policy of issuing coins, coins in his own name. It was during the time of the Mughal dynasty that many art forms were encouraged to flourish. Emperor Jehangir supported the arts. Therefore, it's not surprising that the art of minting coins began and um, reached its peak of perfection during his reign. What is true about Mughal Emperor Jahangir? Three. When microscopes are referred to, most people think of optical microscopes. These instruments were developed principally to meet the needs of the biological sciences. They aren't that useful for metallurgists. They, uh, Metallurgists have large and awkwardly shaped specimens, so those who need to examine metal objects or metal structures use a metallurgical microscope. This is a special, uh, the observing and illuminating systems of a metallurgical microscope are mounted in a way that allows adjustment for accommodating odd-shaped samples. Metallurgical microscopes are equipped with devices that provide the capacity to measure an object in the X, Y, and Z axes. These microscopes are frequently used in the field instead of in the laboratory, so they must be, must be more durable. How is a metallurgical microscope different from an optical microscope? Okay, number four. Four. Since people communicate mostly through speech, you can imagine that a defect in speaking or hearing abilities can be an enormous handicap, right? Okay, there are three conditions in which communication disorders can result. Any ideas what these may be? Three conditions. Yes? Well, the obvious condition, I think, would be a physical one. Let's say, like, if someone's eardrum has been damaged because of an illness or an injury, that person might not be able to hear. And um, being deaf or partially deaf not only affects the person's ability to hear, but also deaf people's speech sometimes isn't all that clear, so that makes it difficult for others to understand them. You bet. If something goes wrong with the speech or hearing mechanisms, communication disorders can result. Uh, Sue? 
Well, I have a cousin who suffered brain damage in an accident, and he can't speak very well. And some people are just born with, uh, something wrong. Yes. That's a condition we would classify... We classify it under the condition of abnormal functioning of the brain. Besides accidents, people may be born with this condition, or it can occur as a result of a stroke or a tumor. And the third condition, anybody? Well, some people have been uh, badly shocked, uh, traumatized, and they get kind of emotionally upset, you know. I read about a boy who just stopped talking after he saw this really terrible accident. Good point. Yes, an unusual emotional or psychological problem can cause communication disorders. Okay, so communication disorders can result from, um, one, something going wrong with the speech or hearing mechanisms, uh, two, abnormal functioning of the brain, and finally, an unusual emotional or psychological problem. Now, fortunately, most communication disorders can be improved to, to some degree with the help of a speech pathologist. What is true about communication disorders? Okay. So, we had one long audio with many different questions, right? They gave you very little time between each one, but we had the opportunity to listen twice and answer it. So what was two answers that they said about fish rubbings? What was it? Was it A and C? A and C? A yes. and C. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. And what was true about Mongol Emperor Jahangir? B and D. B and D. B and D. B and D. Great. And how is metallurgical microscopes different from an optical microscope? A and B. A and B. A and B. Wow. All right. And the last one, what is the true communication? What is true about communication disorder? B and C. B and C. B and C. B and C. Okay. So I see that in this part of the listening was much easier for you because I see that everybody got these answers correct. Do you feel better in this type of listening questions? Yes. Yes. Yes, for this one, yes. 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 Okay, that's good. That means yes. that's confidence. So that when you do the exam, you're going to have the opportunity to get better scores in different parts. Okay? And okay. that's the objective. Try to find what areas are difficult and what areas are easy so that you know where you need to practice more and which areas you're doing okay in. Okay. Okay. All right. So in this moment, we're going to have, I'm going to share with you just a little bit so that we can get an idea. Here's a link. Okay. Oh, I see we only have nine minutes. Maybe not. We won't have time to go ahead and continue with that one, but we can start at least one part. So I'll share here. Okay. Here, we can see that we finished that. That means that tomorrow we will be doing listening practice test two. This is the listening practice to help us. And then we have the midterm. Um, tomorrow, we will not be doing the midterm. The midterm, we will be doing it on Thursday, okay? So remember, the midterm is 10 questions about unit one and two. But tomorrow, we will be focused on practicing a little bit more listening for example, here, the listening practice and several different types of questions with that, about all of that, okay? And also tomorrow, we will also be taking our first TOEFL practice question section. So tomorrow, we will take the, the TOEFL practice questions and you will have just like an idea of how is the instructions, the reading, the questions, the audios for tomorrow, okay? Right now, we're going to practice the first part of the listening. We have a few moments, so we're going to do the first part of the listening practice test two. We're going to do number one. Number one says, what can be inferred about the value of circumstantial evidence for prosecutors? 
So let's listen and see if we can understand what is the value. Okay, so uh, do you want to review that legal terminology that Dr. Bryant went over in class? Okay, yeah, but uh, I was going to meet my roommate at the Union. We plan to jog around campus for some exercise. You can come along too if you feel up to it. Great, thanks. I'd like that. But shouldn't we review the terms first? Okay, we've got a few minutes, I guess. So, what was the first one? Uh, it's burden of proof. What do you remember about that? Okay, well, this one has to do with the fact that in law cases, every person is presumed to be innocent until they're proven guilty, right? Well, yeah, but what else? What's the important thing? And, and, uh, it means that the party that brings the case, that's the plaintiff, has to prove the allegations in order to win the case, okay? Okay, and the defendant that's the person who's being accused, has the right, or the opportunity, to disprove the accusation. That is, the defendant can show or try to show that the accusation is false and that the evidence used against him or her is weak. So that means that the burden of proof is always, uh, always rests on the party, the, the person making the accusation, because the defendant is presumed innocent and so has to be proven guilty. So, in a criminal case, it's up to the prosecutor to convince the judge or the jury that the allegations are true. The burden of proof rests with him or her. The prosecutor, that's the government lawyer, right? Uh, usually, but as far as I can remember, anyone can act as a prosecutor. Uh, except, uh, except in certain types of cases. Anyway, what was the next term you wanted to review? Well, uh... What exactly is meant by circumstantial evidence? Okay, circumstantial evidence. Let me think. Oh, yeah, well, that's like indirect evidence. Yeah, okay. So it kind of implies someone could have been involved in a crime. It's not, um, it's not, it doesn't in itself directly prove who did it. So what about evidence from a witness who says they heard or saw a person commit the crime? No, that's not circumstantial. That's called direct evidence. It has to be more indirect than that. Just about everything that is not direct is called circumstantial. Remember Dr. Bryant gave an example? What was it now? Yeah, okay. He gave a couple of examples. One was, um, suppose a man earns a certain known salary and then makes some big purchases way beyond what someone on his salary could afford. He, he might buy a luxury yacht or a new beachfront apartment or something. And this happens around the time he is alleged to have stolen a large sum of money. This is not direct proof, but it is circumstantial. It would help build a case against him. Right. And it could be used in a court of law, right? Yeah, right. Unless the connection is really weak. Didn't Dr. Bryant say that, in fact, most convictions in court are based on circumstantial evidence? Yeah, I remember him saying that. Most people have the opposite idea, maybe from watching too many TV dramas. But in real life, circumstantial evidence is considered very persuasive. A strong circumstantial case is often better than an eyewitness description. Hmm, quite a bit of information. And as you see, what was the trick? The trick was giving you a lot of information, a lot of vocabulary, a lot of things at the beginning to distract you. But if you read the question first, you are listening for the words. You are listening for the words, circumstantial evidence. And when you hear circumstantial evidence, ah, now you're focused better. But if you don't read the question, what happens? You have to try to remember everything. And then... When finish the reading, when finishes the listening, then you read the question and you're not going to remember. That's why it's always important. First, read the question. First, read the question. Because it's impossible to remember these long questions or these long dialogues. Here, what do you think can be inferred about the value of circumstantial evidence? I think letter C. Letter C. Okay, does anybody agree or disagree? 
Letter C. Sorry, Yancy? Letter C. Letter C as well, Yancy. Okay. Okay. Very good. Letter C is correct because they use it to get a conviction. It's not proof, but circumstantial evidence helps a lot because you have like the example that they gave you. Mm -hmm. So how do you feel now with the four types of listening? Do you feel you have the idea of how to do them correctly? On this part, I think uh, we can't uh, understand a little bit more the listening. Okay. Yeah, it's amazing, right? Because it's funny. The listening is longer. Yes. But you understand more than when the listening is shorter. <laughs> yeah, it is. And then helps to read the the question before too. Because yes. we associate the words or the ideas. Correct. And that is why always I say read the question first. Also remember that at the beginning, they give you information that is not necessary. Just is the same topic, but it's only to give you a little background before they give you the actual information. Mm -hmm. Okay. We mm -hmm. are going to pause right there. But tomorrow, remember, we have two activities. We're going to do one practice test, and then we're going to do one TOEFL reading section completely. Okay. Okay. All right, guys. Have a great okay. night. And I'll okay. see you tomorrow. Bye, guys. Thank Good you. Good night for everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.